Hello, I'm Jason Turvey of the Class Consciousness Project, and with me today is my comrade Terry, also from the Class Consciousness Project. Um, good afternoon, Terry. We're going to talk uh, this afternoon about trade unions, trade unionism. Yeah, all right, Jason. All right, good afternoon. How are you doing? Good yeah, I'm, I'm not too yeah, bad. I'm all right, mate. I'm not too right, bad. Mate. So, um, you've written a couple of articles. In fact, I think it's uh, three, three articles for the the project about your your experience as a as a trade union man um including articles about polaroid sunglasses and uh the builders strike to name but two but what what's your what's your personal experience how did you get into the trade union movement in the first place the first me, me, the first moments i joined the, the sogat uh, society of graphical allied trade workers union was when i worked in a paper mill in my local town worked there for nine months didn't really have any experience of trade unions, just the fact that um, watched what the older guys did and really sort of, I went to a meeting and sort of really didn't take a lot of notice of it. I was only, what, 17. But when I left there and I, um, a few months later, I was out of work for a little bit. I got a job on the buildings in North Wales. And that brought me up to, uh, it was the end of 71. So then, of course, the National Building Strike came along and, and that opened my eyes to the treatment of workers uh, by the government um, and, and bosses because they, they were after certain wage rises for the labourers. I mean, I was on, on the erection side of it, so we were building flats. We were on more money than the average, la the average labourer. But um, I could see that a man gnarled from arthritis digging holes was worth a lot more than 49p an hour, as it was then. And and I think they, they didn't get much more than that after the strike. But we went on a 13-week strike for, for that. And that really uh, got me into what unions, solidarity, if you like. That's um, I think that's where I'd, I'd start from, that my first uh, thoughts into my mind. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. what what was your what was your experiences of the building trade in the early nineteen seventies? The crack was good, as the Paddies would say. Um, I worked with all different nationalities, uh, different accents from Britain abroad. But the oh, and the crack was good. The way it, the hours were long. I worked from eight in the morning till six every day, Monday to Friday, and we worked. On Saturday, eight till six as well, but we only actually we worked eight. We were paid eight till eight till six, but we worked. We finished at twelve. Um, Job and Jack they used to call it. We get the concrete done for that day, and if they asked to do the concrete in the week, it would take ten hours. But on a Saturday, because you were finished early, it only took you four. It's yeah. one of them, isn't it? One of them. <laughs> yeah. So that's, uh, and. And we weren't really a, a you. We were all in the union. We were in the Transport and General Workers Union, um, but we we weren't sort of active or anything. We just went to work, did our job, and then the National Building Strike came, and um, and and they came around. The pickets came around. We down tools, and we went off. And I think, actually, the the um, the guys that I worked with were good, <clears throat> good lads. I worked with a great guy from Jamaica. He lived. He lived in in Leeds actually, but he was on. He was lodging in Flint in North Wales. He was a welder. He used to tell me because I I know you don't like the music, but I like reggae and ska and stuff. And he he used to tell me about Kingston, and so my, I talked to him for hours. Like, but yeah, that was that was interesting. <clears throat> the people you do meet in the trade union, uh, to me, being a trade unionist, are, are fantastic from all over the all over the country. Geordie's hard to understand, mind. I get along with everything else. <laughs> so, so it was a, it was a, it was a tough life in the building trade in the early seventies. There was a lot yeah. of, um, lot of health oh, and safety of issues. Health and safety, yeah. That was a big, that was a big issue. But the thing was, because we were a small gang, there was only ten of us. At, yeah, ten, and um, we sort of the, you, the sites already laid out when you get there. Because you're moving in just to build the flats, that the, all the drainage and everything was basically all done by the by uh, labouring gangs. So when you got there, all the, to the the toilet blocks were built and all that caper. But there was no eating. I mean, you you wash your hands at the end of end of the day in a, in a bucket of diesel, 
um, and and just dried them off like that. It was it was horrible, but you didn't know any difference. Everyone did it. Um, you put your shovel if you've been concrete and just in a big drum with diesel in, threw it in there, left it there till the next day, wash it off. Uh, health and safety was lacking. Uh, some of the antics I've seen people get up to, you, I mean, you'd be locked up if you did them today. You would, I mean, that's just the workers, not just the bosses. Um, things the workers used to do, dangerous, dangerous things. But it's, it's improved now. But I don't think the building game's as as good as it used to be. You know, mm. but that's progress, I suppose. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um... Certainly, it's, it's 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 good that the building game is as safe as it is today. It's still occasionally dangerous, though. There are still accidents yeah. on on work sites, but it was it was very very um, devil may care, wasn't it, back in the early nineteen seventies? Yeah. And and like you said, some of the problems were coming from the workers themselves, weren't they? They got into old habits, uh, not necessarily good habits, and and often put getting the job done over yeah. their own health and safety, didn't they? Yeah, if they, if they, a lot of times, if they thought they could get away early, they'd cut corners. And when you're at 200 feet in the air, leaning over the end parapet with no safety harness on attached to a block, and that's something you should, you don't want to be doing. And I wouldn't do it. Um, but maybe that was, maybe, maybe rebellious nature came out in the buildings. And that just may, maybe sort of pushed my mind up onto the trade union side of things. But I looked at people and I said, why are you doing it? Oh, God. Went off then for a minute, sorry. No, no, um, you still recover. Still here. Yeah. Um, and I thought, well, what, why are you doing that? And I was the youngest, you see. So it was like, oh, shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. So, well, I know what I'm talking about. I fell off the building. Mm. And so will you. But I was a bit, I suppose you have to be, to, to become a shop steward, you've got to be a bit mouthy. So I probably was. And there's probably a few there wants to give me a clip. But I, they knew I was right in the end, really. And I was only a young fella telling them, that they weren't doing things. My dad wouldn't cut corners. He'd climb in that crane. He wouldn't, um, when they were erecting them and everything, I watched him and he was health and safety conscious. So, you know, it, it, you don't have to be. Um... And sometimes it suits because if it was too windy to work, um, then the job would stop and you'd sit in the cabin until the wind went down. Mm. We didn't work in the rain in them days either. No, no, that's true. Whether they do now. Yeah, yeah, they do. So what what was your um what was your first hand experience of the lump? There was the I mean that was I, I yeah. read Eileen Turnbull's book about the the Shrewsbury twenty four campaign, and the lump was mentioned on more than one occasion. It was quite divisive in the building trade, wasn't it? Tell tell people who are watching what what the lump was and what well, effect it had. It was you you paid your own you got it you took a job as it's self employed you paid your own tax national insurance. It was a way really of of paying, a, a, I suppose, of paying a guy come along and says he was a joiner and just pay me cash in hand and I'll sort me stuff out. But it was it was undermining the, the wages of the of the other, of say, the affiliated joiners who were bona fide. And these were guys would come along and working, undercutting them, if you like. It didn't happen on the site I was on. Um, we didn't have, we didn't have any problem with, it was all above board, everyone was in a union. Um, but the sites that they visited when they got done, the pick the Shrewsbury pickets, I didn't visit that site, but I did go on on buses, the uh, flying pickets, if you like, that picked us up in various parts of the, the area, and we went on buses to various places in the country that was not too far from your area. The buses came from Liverpool, and I believe actually the buses was I'm not factually um, correct, but somebody did tell me that the buses were. Were, sank, were supplied by the Liverpool dock workers. They were paid for by them to, to support the building workers. I know the dock workers did support the building workers. Um, but the lump, it's it's a horrible because pits man against man. So one man's here on, on a wage where he's paying tax national insurance and this guy's working next to him. He's not, and for what all intents and purposes to this guy, he's paying nothing. And he's undercut him in a job. So when he goes to a site, um, then the, the union guy goes there for the job. I'm in a union. Well, don't want to know. And that was the problem because they were all employed by the the famous Sir Robert McAlpine, um, 
you know, you had you had them, Wimpies, a lot of Irish firms, a lot of Irish firms, because they would they'd bring them over. You know, the lads had come over to work because Ireland was destitute with no with jobs like. So they'd come over to Britain. Fair play, fair, great. I liked them. Um, but a lot of them were brought over specifically to just work cash in hand. And that was it. I don't blame some of those, but there was some people who were definitely um, under undercutting the system. And that's what the, the, the strike was about. It was about more pay, but it was also about the lump. Um, and as far as I can, and what I've read and heard, that still goes on in some places, that lump. Even though they said so the lump still goes on today, I've I've read I've read and heard like that Dave Smith who who did that Besner dispute, who was involved in that, that was a, a that was health and safety and stuff. But I'm convinced that because unions aren't involved greatly in the the building game now, I would imagine, and people have said that the lump still goes on. So, but I can't speak that for I don't know that for a fact. But all I know is that. Three or four of my son's mates have gone as digger drivers on that um, H2, H2S, is it H2, H2S the, um, building project from... Oh, HS, HS2. HS2, yeah, HS2. The railway line um, from London to Birmingham. Yeah, well, they, they've gone on digging that. I mean, the, the joke in the in the movements is, you know, I'd play in hide and seek on a grand a week because the, the, that it's, it's that big. They've told me the last, but none of them are in the union. Hmm. And it yeah. strikes me that if if you were in a union, you wouldn't get a job. So it's something you wouldn't say. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, mm. do, do, I, I know, I know you haven't been in, or you you let the left the building game a long time ago. Mm. But but what are your reflections on? Before we go on to to other parts of your own career, what do you think's gone wrong in the building trade with regard to unionisation? Because it, it it was very strong in the early nineteen seventies, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, but well, well the, the, the men get older and retire or die, and the young ones that, that were coming through, apart from like my my era, I think was the last. But after that, they weren't interested in unions. I blame the trade unions themselves, the leaders, for, for not continuing the recruitment campaigns that they used to have in the sixties. I mean, I, I remember my dad telling me that when. When you'd go on a site in the 60s, you would go on a site in Liverpool. He worked a lot in Liverpool because they're building it up in the 60s. And there'd be a guy at the door. He'd be a shop steward for um, for the, the local union, whichever it was at the time, Miss T&G perhaps. You in a union, mate? Yes. Well, OK, you're all right. Next guy. You in a union, mate? No, get lost. Yeah. Close shop. Mm. Whereas I think it would be the opposite now. If you went there and they asked you in a union, you'd be the one told to, to go to go bye-bye. Yeah. So that's probably, um, it's gone from that. The strike took it out of, a, I suppose, took it out of a lot of people. They, they didn't get what they wanted. May, they may have got made the lump, was probably declared illegal. But you know and I know that they can say something's illegal, but then they just turn a blind eye to it still carrying on. So um, I don't think there's any organisation anymore, as there used to be. But I found, Jason, that it, it, we didn't we didn't have a site... Um, in our gang, a shop steward. We were all in the union, but we did, we had a spoke. If if he had a problem, my dad or his mate would probably go in and speak because they were the oldest two. Um, but I found it was the men themselves that that, that um organised stuff, organised people being in a union, bucket collections. Because because if you remember, well, you may not, but um, you you probably won't. Because years ago, when they didn't have the, the check off, you would pay to a, a shop steward. Well. I, we were paying into our, out of our wages at that time, so we didn't actually pay money to us to a, a collector. But well, prior to that, they did, and people and that the collector was was a position who would go round and collect the, the union subs every week. I know you always get the ones get see me next week and all this business, but that's the same with everything. But then it went to the check off, and then the unions. Then that's that's one little thing they haven't got to worry about then, and that then to me smacks of taking a they're not recruiting. Because if they come across somebody who isn't in a union, surely they would say to them, well, these, you, these are the reasons you've got to join a union. But I've, I've been spoiled by that because everywhere I've worked has always been fully, fully unionised. So um, today's a lot different. Yeah, 
Yeah, they are. I mean, just to explain to people who are watching and might not know, the checkoff is a system by which you pay your union subscriptions through your wages. So it's taken out as part of your stoppages alongside your tax and your national insurance and so on. Now, the unions would pay for that privilege. They would actually pay employers to run the checkoff. And it was it was very convenient for individual members, but it did come with its own problems, didn't it? Because obviously the checkoff meant that the, the employer knew who was in the union. Because all they had to do was look at their payroll details and they would see for themselves. Whereas um, before that, when when subs were paid in cash, uh, offered to a branch secretary or like you say, a shop steward, um, it was between the union and the member mm. who that person or what union that person was a member of. The employer didn't actually know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the checkoff was a bit of a mixed bag. And I know yeah. I know that certain employers, public sector employers in the last few years have had the checkoff cancelled. And I, I, I had a lot of debates with people in the, on the broader modern left, shall we say, saying that getting rid of the checkoff was a bad idea. But in fact, it can be it can be a good thing because it means that the relationship between the union and the employer is slightly more distance. And the only people that need know who's in a union is obviously the employer when there's a strike or when there's a ballot for strike action. Mm. But the rest of the time, it's none of their business. Yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> it's a difficult one, the checkoff. But like you said, it means... It meant that that face-to-face -face contact between your your, mm. your shop steward or your branch secretary and the members is gone. That that's the only difference I see on the likes of of build, of the building trade where you're moving around. But when I after I left the buildings, I went to work in a factory, and that was the TNG. That was hundred percent union. There was no one work there that wasn't in a union. So in fact, the man on interview, the management used to say to the people who were getting interviewed. Obviously, they can't tell them they've got to join the union, but they'd say to them, um, the, the union here is the transport and general workers. Um, if you wish to join, <clears throat> you're free to do so. But they didn't say, you've had to join. Um, when I want, uh, well, Later on in life, I wanted that to be put into the interview. Well, we didn't get our way with that because the laws changed. And blah, blah, blah. At the beginning, um, no one that came onto our site was not in a union. And in fact, during the road haulage dispute in probably the late 70s, maybe the early 80s, I can't, I can't think. We had, we had um, and, the, and the guys were out on strike, the, the road haulage guys were out on strike, and wagons used to come into our place from all over the country. Now, you'd get people who, who were on strike, but, but working. So they, they wouldn't say they were in a union, so they'd come to the gate for a, they'd got a load off somewhere. If their firm would be on strike, their their driving company, so you get them come there, and, and the shop shoes will go around and check if they've got a union card, and they'd say no, so we wouldn't load them or offload them, and and the management accepted that because it caused them more trouble by them saying you will offload that wagon and us saying we won't because the end product would have been we'd have been all out the gates. So they thought, mm, yeah, OK, Just listen, mate, next time you come in, you've got to be in a union. They, they'd send them on the way. So in that respect, um, I haven't had to suffer with with this business of um, people not being in a union, which is something I've never understood um, in the old days. I can see a point to a degree now um, because they don't seem to do much for you. But it's still a protection. If, if if all else fails in life, it's still a protection that someone might come along and take your case up for unfair dismissal or um, you can get a some free car insurance or a <laughs> holiday in Barbados, I don't know. But, yeah, it's not the same union as our unions as I remember. But the, you're right, um, the Chekhov has got its advantages and disadvantages, shall we say. Yeah, exactly. Um, so... You say you moved on from the building game and ended up working in a factory. What was the what was the story behind that move, and why did you leave the building game to start with? Well, when when um, the strike finished, we 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 hadn't quite finished the site that we were on, so we came back to that site and we finished off the rest of the masonettes that we were building. The tower. We built the tower block, and we were doing masonettes. And when we finished them. They called us to a meeting. Now, there was jobs coming off in, in Liverpool, Paradise Street car park. 
And I wanted to go to that because obviously it's handy for me. I can get the tube over to Liverpool and it's half an hour from where I live. And so if my dad had had an accident and um, and he broke his ankle and he was never going to climb a crane again, basically, his ankle was pinned up. That was health and safety. That was a He won a case actually in the High Court against um, Concrete Northern for that. Or we shouldn't mention the name. But anyway, um, that, that's what, what happened there. But and I and I put I said, oh, I'll be going to. We'll all be going as a gang to Paradise Street. But what they did, they they split us up. There was they took, sent three guys from Liverpool to Manchester. This I was from the Whittle. They I got a choice to either go to Stockport or Air in Scotland. Um, some guys that were actually worked from Manchester, they wanted to send them to Bristol, I think Bristol or Birmingham. So they were splitting, sending you the most awkward places for you because them guys lived in Liverpool. It would have been ideal for them. No, we don't want to do that. We'll split this gang up. They've been in the strike. They're all militant. But what they didn't realise, they'd done that on every site. Every company had split the gangs up, thinking that they were going to split up this bloody unionism. But you met with people who'd been on strike and on pickets who you'd never met before, but from other sites. Yeah. And then you got Pally with them. So it, it didn't alter it. But my, really, my it was up for me when they sent me to the, to Stockport. I, in the end, I opted to go to Stockport. They sent me there, and I sat in the cabin for four days because the job that they sent me there, um, he said, we've given that job to, to somebody else. And I said, well, I'm not doing, going back to the beginning. I'm a, I'm an, I come here as a precast director, which is the top job. And I'm not going back to just dry packing concrete under the walls. I've done all that. He said, well, you won't do anything then. He said, you can go back to Flint. So I went back to Flint, but that job was nearly finished. And in the end, he said, we haven't got anything for you. And he just made me redundant. He just wanted me rid of me, really. I suppose mm-hmm. I was a bit of a pain in the arse. I don't know. Then. And and at the time, I was co- I was going with a girl, um, as they used to say, courting in them days. Courting, yes. Courting, yeah. Now, now, she worked at Castle, and she was on... 62p an hour. And I worked on the build, and she worked 40 hours a week in the dry. And I worked on the buildings in the freezing cold in the winter and, and bone hard looking concrete for, for 58 and a half p an hour. And I thought to myself, well, if they're going to kick me off the buildings, she's on more money. This is before equal pay came in. The men there were on over a pound. I'm thinking, what am I doing here in the middle of the winter? But I did like the job, you know, I mean, even so, it's one of them. I didn't really want to go in a factory, but I went there and it was easy. It's it, it was easy. Like, warm your cabins, you could get warm stuff. Oh, it was great. And that's I ended up staying there till till that was nearly shutting down. My department shut down. I was there for nearly 20 years. Right. Um, yeah, it, it, yeah, I was, uh, but uh, that courtship didn't last very long. But anyway, I'd, I'd already got a job in there by then. So, yeah, um, I'm within... I suppose a short space of time. I'd I'd i stood for shop steward of the department. I was I was working after about nine months, I think. Right. And went on from there. And that was that was a unionised workplace as well. So that was Transport and General Workers Union too, wasn't it? Well, that was the the uh, Transport and General Workers Union, but obviously the office staff was um, ASTMS then MSF now, um, unless they've amalgamated with somebody else again. Uh, and obviously you had fitters, welders, joiners. You had the whole, there was no contract, as you see. You had the whole in house sort of thing. You had a carpenter, you had plumbers, you had welding guys, you had guys who'd come around and fix the scales. You had proper trained guys in, in a trade that were working, all unionized in their particular AEU, it would be, or AEW, whatever. And the electricians union, that that'd be, they'd be there. Um, and and so every everything was organized in its, in its own trade trade group or you trade union so yeah it i didn't think anything different i never thought there was places that you would allow non-union labor to be in them it just never occurred to me in them days yeah because yeah, all my mates worked in shell totally unionized Vauxhalls, very totally unionized all the big factories by us all trade unions all and as we gradually progressed and became a brand secretary I sat on the district committee, so you branch secretaries from every group, and every factory was 
major factory was um, represented by the branch secretary there. So there'd be about 20 people at the district meetings every month. So it's so it was a heavily unionised town. That was me, of course. Yeah, yeah, so it sounds it. And it, it had its fair share of local industry, didn't it? As, didn't it, oh. as you say? Um, so, yeah, it was inevitable there was going to be strong union or unionisation in the first place, but obviously union connections. Because obviously what's difficult to perhaps understand for, for younger viewers watching this is that there were so many trade unions back then, weren't there? There were so many very specialised trade unions. Yeah. Um, all kinds of, um, you know, like you said, for office staff, for, uh, you know, carpenters, all kinds of tradesmen have their own their own craft unions as well. Um, and a lot of those have been swept away, not only like like you were saying earlier on about SOGAT, the graphical workers union, you know, a lot of the, the trade unions in the printing industry were swept away by the changes in print technology, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. Um, and either... Uh, merged with other unions and and that all became kind of watered down if you like you know the, the specialism of the trade that they had um or or they were sort of swept away by by the the technology that they they operated on being made obsolete that happened mm. quite a lot didn't it yeah 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 we'll yeah do. so so you become a shop steward whilst working at this particular factory yeah uh it was i'd be, i joined there in july 73 and I did a nine to 12 months on this gang called the float gang. They used to cover holidays and sickness around the site. And then you get out after that, you get allocated to the department as someone retired and they wanted to replace them. They'd replace them off the float gang and employ from outside to go on the float gang. So that's how the system worked. So that, that I got into the, the job in the, in the grease making departments and they didn't have a shop steward. They'd had an old, they had an old chairman of the union who was, to, by anyone's standards, was a dinosaur. Um, and this guy w was, he would, he'd agree with the manager on every everything. So he's one of them, old fashioned, believed it was touch the floor lap when the boss went by. Well, I wasn't going to have any of that, not after 13 weeks strike on the buildings and then coming into a factory. So he retired. So we were without representation in our section. So I w spoke to the, um, Branch Secretary said he, who uh, I must say I didn't get on with. And he said, well, you, you'd have to get a nomination, a, a nom uh, somebody to nominate you and second year, pose and second year. I did that. Nobody else wanted to stand. They weren't really particularly happy that it was me doing it, I suppose, but nobody else wanted to do it. Anyway, I went from there and I just became a shop steward and attended the meetings for oh, about six months. And, the, and then the chairman, our chairman, got ill and he, he asked, he was going in part time, so he asked me, "Would I um, sit in for him if he couldn't attend meetings?" And that's how I got into, for me, sins reading the ABC of chairmanship by Lord Citrine and and finding out how to run meetings and all this. Paper, which did, that didn't work well. It, it it's a good book if you. It is, yeah, yeah. it is. If, if if people don't know it, you know, it's it, it helps you. You can bamboozle people with it, but anyway, uh, so so he eventually packed it in and I stood for the chair and the, the guy, the existing, um, he, he packed it in. Yeah. I, I stood for the chair. No, sorry. I didn't at first. I wasn't sure whether I should I stayed as a shop student. Two other guys became branch secretary and chairman, older guys. This one was rubbish. This chairman. Anyway, I, I swore the next biennial elections, I would stand. And I did. And it was 75. 77. I think it was about 76 or 7. I got the, uh, the... No, it was earlier than that. 76. I got the chair's job and um, the second said, then then the biannual, he, he resigned, then the biannual elections came and I stood for branch secretary. Um, everyone said, you're mad. And I said, well, he's useless and somebody's got to do it and he's not defending us. So I stood against him. And this is what I say to people. Um, when I finished my career, was on the post, and the young lads used to say to me, why don't you do the union job? You know, you know what you're talking about. And I said, I'm here for about another 10 years. You're here for another 40 or 50. So shouldn't you be doing it and look after your jobs? I'm past that now. And I was, to be honest. Um, I, I, I got into the end that you just sort of, you plodded on and just 
that you, you made sure you weren't shit on and nobody around you. But that's how I ended up becoming brand secretary. Um, I was briefly a chairman for a short time, which was okay. Ran the meetings okay. And then uh, the brand secretary's job was, was better. I wasn't popular, though, with other brand secretaries from other companies when we had district meetings. Once again, I was the youngest branch secretary in, in on the district committee. And these were all old asses who, who thought the union was there to have a meeting once a month and give them a five of expenses so they could go and spend it in the sports and pub over the road after the meeting had finished. Well, I didn't think that was what representing your members was about. You shouldn't be out of pocket, don't get me wrong, but you shouldn't no. exploit the system. No, absolutely not. So what were your... Well, what was your earliest experiences of being a, a, a branch secretary? I mean, I've been branch secretary. It's, it's, it, it can be quite hard work, but uh, what, what was your experiences of it? Well, in in that fact, in, in the uh, branch secretary, in, the way it worked in Ellesmere Port was that the, in some other places it might not be, but he was the number one, if you like. And um, I found... A respect, but also what what I what I was um, quite proud of was that because I got heavily involved in trade unionism and I did study a lot about um, welfare rights and things like that. That I I maybe go out for a pint with my dad on a Friday or something, and and somebody come up to you in the pub, and they'd say, "Excuse me, older men, I believe you're a union man." Bang, that gets you. That's mm. you there. You're a union man, and I've got a problem. Can you help me? And my dad, you say to me, "Why are you bothering to?" I said, "You can't switch off. If he needs no. help, you give it him. If it's twenty four hours, seven days a week, it doesn't matter. That's in you now. You've took that responsibility. And he might be a stranger who happened to know me dad, but he'd come and say, I believe you're a union man.' My dad was quite proud of me after that. Actually, from that point, I could tell." Um, but a lot of a lot that I've seen with people, they become power crazy, <clears throat> and they only want the job for the status. I mean, I got offered status, but I didn't want it. It's like you, well, you can have. We didn't have laptops, mobile phones, and stuff. If I'd have had a laptop in them days, God, so much easier to write a report than a second-hand typewriter. I bought, I got from a charity shop, and and doing it two fingers like double spacing. You know what I'm on about. And and like yeah, it's the, uh, but but I did I did all that and and it, you're you're equal to the manager. He he can't he can't um, make your members do anything unless you've agreed it. And they wouldn't go above your head, not in them days. You know, you wouldn't proper negotiations and um, proper a lot of paperwork, report writing and stuff like that. But I didn't mind that. I liked it. Yeah, it, it it is quite rewarding. But as you say, it was a, a 24-7 sort of job being a, a, a trade union person. You never switch off. And, no. and you almost saw everything around you through a trade union lens, didn't you? You know, it was a uh, it was it was quite something to be involved in the trade union movement and yeah. um, uh, a big responsibility. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. So you, you you mentioned your time in the uh, in the uh, Royal Mail. Yeah. Um, what was your? I mean, you, you didn't become a shop steward or a rep in the no. post office, did you? No. No, I took on the health and safety reps job for a short time, but um, I when did I join there? How long did I stay? There? I left Castle in ninety four, ninety seven. Yeah, the year my dad died. Ninety seven, I got I, I joined the Royal Mail. I, I met somebody else, and I lived in, in Lancashire. I joined the Royal Mail up there, and uh, and it was great. And anyway, we had a, we had Lewis, and um, my wife said her mum wasn't well. She'd like to come back to Ellesmere Port, and I said, well, I'm not going back without a job. I want to be unemployed, and I've got a job here. So I saw, I got a transfer to Chester. That's as it happened. <clears throat> I was lucky because. We were, at, we were in a council house. We didn't have any house to sell, um, worrying about kids changing schools and all that, because, you know. Anyway, um, I, I came back and stayed with my brother for nine months to 12 months while we were looking for somewhere or waiting for a council house or whatever. In the end, they moved down 
And because we were overcrowded there, we got a council house and we're still in it. But, but I joined, the, so I obviously went into Chester Royal Mail and I know Chester because it's basically where I used to knock around when I was young. Um, and yeah, I, I, but I didn't join as a, I didn't become a rep. Even though the rep they had was particularly rubbish, I didn't feel I knew enough about the very, very complicated system of working they have in Royal Mail with regards to payments. And you'd have to really study it to know you were taught saying the right things. I would back up the shop steward, even if he, even though he was rubbish, because he was the union man, and that's that's the end of it. But no, I didn't. And a few years before I left, I did take the health and safety reps job on. But the, the full-time official, um, who, the full-time convener, he, um, he made a decision about something to do with health and safety with the management without an agreement from the shop floor. And I said to him, well, if you're going to do that, then what's the point in having health and safety reps? So I resigned from that position. Um, it was over icy weather. It was wintry, particularly wintry, and it was about postman falling and them saying that, that it was the postman's fault and it, the, the liability was the postman and not the, the Royal Mail. So we said, well, if it's the postman's fault, we're not going out on delivery. We'll stay here. We'll sit here and sort mail till, till it thaws. And it was one of those years where it didn't thaw for weeks. <laughs> one of them. It was just ice on top of ice. And he did that, and I said, that's it, finished. I'll just I'll plod on and, and do my own. Support the union, but... Do me own, make sure I'm covered and people around me. That's how I ended up really. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what, what are your reflections on what's happened in, in Royal Mail? You know, sure. since, since since the time you left, I suppose would be would be a good place to start. I mean, we've talked before, we've recorded podcasts and well, I've written articles for the Class Consciousness Project website about the Communication Workers Union, which is the union that represents the, the postal workers. And um, they collapsed last year in the role mail dispute was, was little short of a, a, a complete disgrace, but I, you, you might still have contact with people who still work in role mail. What, what's your reflections on what happened there? You, you're right. The, the shop steward, they, they, they got a decent shop steward and he, he got sacked and they didn't have anyone really representing him in Chester office. Can't speak for any other office, but it's the hierarchy of bullying that, that was there when I went there um, and it was there m m when I left. It didn't affect me because, well, I'm not going to be bullied by some boss who's who's 30 years younger than me, who's only just come out of university. I'm not decrying anyone who goes to university. I'm just saying, don't come and tell me my job when you haven't done it yourself. Yeah. And there was a lot of that. And bullying of young people, bullying of women, especially female posties, which I was particularly... Um, I thought was particularly disgusting that the you know young young girls come in there to think oh you know I've got a job and it's a good outdoor job and they look and they're bullied and it breaks their heart and they have to pack it in which I thought was a disgrace. Now yeah. I said to one manager one day I said are you proud of yourself you made her cry. He said you mind your own business and I will not. Why well, mind my own business you made that girl cry, and you must be proud. Go on to your wife tonight and tell her today honey I made this woman cry, mm. and he was he was going to discipline me. But I had witnesses. Um, and that's the thing. Always have a witness in Royal Mail. Never go on your own to speak to anyone. No. You couldn't. You can't trust any of them. There was some good ones when I went there. A lot of them were ex-army. They liked the idea of the, mili the, you know, the military-style way of operating the Royal Mail sort of thing. So there was a lot of ex-army guys who became managers. And I found them fair. You know, if you did your job, they were fair with you. Um, and they were, but they were strict. But I, I was all right with that. But afterwards, they got people in who were just wanting to break, a bit like Thatcher did to the TUC. The Royal Mail management did to the union. They just broke them, and I don't know why Dave Ward collapsed into into nothing. I didn't, I didn't rate them as as very good in the beginning. When I first started uh, that there's general secretaries, I just thought, well, it's just another general secretary. He'll sit in his office and just, we, you, we, you'll never hear of him and he'll just speak on our behalf and it, we won't agree with any of it. And it'll just go through. And that's what happened. Um, people who work there now say to me, ask me, what, what what year did you leave? And I tell them and they go, oh God, you were lucky. And I said, well, I was lucky because 
I was at the time I could retire early. Um, and I, you know, I haven't got any massive financial commitments. I couldn't stand it any longer. Um, but I could see the change coming and I thought, right. And I, I, I managed to, to get out on the list because all the other lads, too young, mortgage, kids in school, can't just pack in work. And it's, it's a decent wage if you get on the collections and stuff like that. You can make a lot of money with overtime, but the basic wage is not much greater than... It's greater than an average wage, but it's it's not something that's fantastic. I bet there's still people there having to, to get um, benefits, like housing benefits or something like that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 very regrettable what happened last year with the CWU collapsing. Mm. Um it was all not not I don't want to say it was inexplicable because I think there's always an explanation for why it happens, but to go from what they did in 2022, where they had months of industrial action, going from all the way from May 2022 to the end of the year. They got reballoted because of the anti-trade union laws at the end of 2022. They had a 90% mandate for strike action. And then in 2023, didn't take a single day. Yeah, a right. single day of strike action and then collapsed with a deal that was almost exactly the same as the one they'd rejected and spent months going on strike over. Um, yeah. with, with Dave Ward doing his YouTube presentation with his uh, Deputy General Secretary trying to sell the deal that they'd rejected back to the members again. Yeah. Um, it was quite a depressing sight, wasn't it? But when when they said at the beginning, when we, when we spoke about it before, and, and they've said at the beginning that, um, well, and we've known bosses like this, well, you know, this is the deal, this is how it is. You should have seen what they really wanted. Yes. You know what I mean, yes. right? Yeah. And people go, oh, well, we better accept this then. That, what you should have seen what we really wanted, that's what they're trying to do now. And it's like I said at the time, the ink won't be dried on that agreement before Royal Mail will be coming back, trying to push in them extra hours, pushing the reduction in holidays, push, and all the things that they wanted, they will gradually get by stealth or force or bullying. They'll do it. Um, and all Dave Ward can sit there and pontificate all he wants about um, how, how you, we're going to fight for the postman. I see it every day on Post, he say no, on, on Facebook. And it, Thousands of postmen are just saying, you know, well, not on my thousands on my line, but there are in the country disgruntled postmen saying, you know, P Pinky and Perky are back on talking again, or, you know, Coco the Clown's back on. They've got no respect for them. They're not even come out and fought. They just sold them up the river. Yeah. In my opinion. Yeah. No, I, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, I, I, I said when we recorded the podcast, when we were talking about uh, trade union collapses, because Let's be clear, the CWU one was not an isolated collapse. You had the collapse of the teachers' uh, dispute last year and the collapse of the Royal College of Nurses' dispute last year as well. So it wasn't isolated. It was it was a pattern of collapse in, you know, major professions with thousands and thousands of employees. Yes. And their trade unions yeah. had sold them out. And and we we I, I remember saying at the time that the the only the only thing I could think of that might explain Dave Ward, and obviously it wasn't Dave Ward on his own. There was a, a whole cabal of other people involved who were negotiating with Royal Mail. But I think the problem was that someone somewhere said to Dave Ward, look, if you push this too far, Royal Mail will collapse. And it was that that made him think, right, I need to row back in what we've done so far, because that's the only way I can, I can reconcile what went on in 2022 with what went on in 2023 and the ultimate collapse of the strike. Someone somewhere said to, to Ward, it's serious. Royal Mail will go under if you carry on the way you're going. Yeah, but prior to it being privatised, I, I um, Royal Mail was paying more out in overtime payments for postmen doing work, um, covering rounds. and Every piece of mail was delivered every day. They weren't on the verge of collapse then. It's, they're only on the verge of collapse because the store, the, the shareholders think they might not get the, get the bonus dividend yeah. this year. Yeah. Or, or the, the, the CEO might not get his, his million pound bonus or whatever it is he was going to get, which I don't know the exact figures. And that's the corrupt part about it. Because when they interviewed that guy, he we've had some shockers to manage Royal Mail, I tell you. Um, but 
when they made agreements, they make agreements knowing that they're going to backtrack on them as soon as they've gone in. And they'll but they'll do it in certain offices. Like Chester's not renowned for being strong in trade union wise. Whereas nearer to you get to Liverpool, like my town, Ellsmere was. There are good trade unionists, but it's not renowned to be a strong, I don't think so. Anyway, um, they've they've tried it out in certain offices and they've got away with it. So then they turn around and say, right, well, we've done it now here. So what what and it's working, whatever it is that they wanted to put in. Well, they might have done it in some rural office with 30 guys, and, and yeah, it might be easy to work, but it won't work in an office with 200 guys, like an office in Birmingham or Liverpool or Manchester, London, Christ, you know. Um, there's yeah. hundreds and hundreds of postmen. <laughs> and if they, they, they can't, you know, do it with everyone, but they'll try and get away with it, and then that becomes the norm. And then when you refuse to do it, because it's not part of your agreement, they'll discipline you. They'll send IB after you. You don't you don't know what IB is, do you? No. Invest, investigation branch, IB. Yeah. They're there to find corruption in the Royal Mail. Okay. But they're like um they're not they do, do that. Because there's a lot of money goes through, there's a lot of registered letters with you know expensive stuff. So it, they, they do investigate stuff like that. But if a postman's being particularly awkward with his line manager. IB will go and will follow that postman and watch and wait for him to make a mistake, like leave your van door unlocked. And they'll sack him for, uh, you know, they'll make up some Trump charge. They've got all kinds of refusal to, you know, uh, not, not caring for the, for the Royal uh, for the, uh, Majesty's Mail and um, sort of things. And one guy jumped out of his car, van open, van door unlocked, jumped into an office, get a paper. They were watching him. Nailed him back in the office, suspended. Right, because he was one of the guys who did anything he was told. He was all right. He just got a slap on the wrist. But other people have actually been sacked for doing the very same thing. So they use they use that to um, to frighten people, um, and they should have one because there are thieves that we we found some out in in our own office that, got, that in the end got the sack. But whilst they were there doing the stuff. If you ever went on their round, you were automatically under suspicion as well. And that's, you know, so there were corrupt people there. But they, they were in a small minority compared to the corrupt people that are running the show, mm. in my opinion. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And what you were saying earlier on about as soon as the ink dries on the agreement, yeah. they will they will go back in and, and get maybe even more than what the agreement said. That happened, didn't it, last year? When 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 the when the CWU collapsed and they signed that deal, bearing in mind that the CWU was saying with regards to changes to their attendance policy, or oh, you should have seen what the Royal Mail wanted to give you, they accepted a degradation of their attendance policy. And then as soon as the Royal Mail agreed it, managers in local offices were then going after staff who would not have flagged up warnings for their attendance under the previous procedure, but the minute the new procedure was signed, they were putting them on warnings. Hmm. So it happened straight away, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. And straight away. Yes, exactly. That's exactly the point. And that's the point that I, that I was referring to when I said that, because that's what I knew they wanted. Because the more they can get people on warnings, the more frightened the people are about losing the job. Yeah. So, you know, uh, and that's the way that they go. Warning, 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 absence mm. warning. The only, the, the only, I suppose the only saving grace in the Royal Mail is you, you, you can, there's a lot of chances to have accidents on duty. Now, as long as you can prove you've had an accident on duty, you will get paid and they won't, you know, hound you. Because, you say, I don't know, people fall over on ice. It's, a, it's an occupational hazard. You chip off yeah. a curb um, and you go back and you've got to take time off. Well, it's not held against you. But they'll only go for it for so long. You can't keep falling off curbs. Because then they say, well, you know, you're just taking the mickey like now. Mm. And there are a few like that, I must admit, that I know some characters, they were, you know, they were off every other week with some backs gone. It's that old injury I got 15 years yeah. ago, caused yeah. by Royal Mail, backs gone again. So, yeah, there was a few like that. But generally, everyone was genuine that I worked with, apart from yeah. the, the management. Yeah. But Castle was the time. Um, I mean, these have all been serious, serious things we've been talking about, but there are some light-hearted moments. I mean, that Polaroid article, that was particularly a funny moment that, I mean, real funny. But there was other things that happened. It's just like when 
when um, Thatcher got elected and the TUC called and announced a, a raft of strikes against the, the government, they used to give every branch secretary tickets. Well, all the branch secretaries in the port, most of them didn't, to go to London to the March or Birmingham or Cardiff. And I went on them all apart from, I think, the, the Birmingham one. Anyway, um, <laughs> we were going... We were going to the first one in London, the big one that they had, and we we were on. And this you, this you'll appreciate this. We were on one of them old trains where you have compartments and a, a walkway down the outside, and a ticket guy comes along down there. And we were sat in here, six of us. I got uh, six. I got six tickets off T and G. Take five comrades. So my five mates came with me, and it was on a Saturday. And uh, anyway, we're on the train, and we get the cards out, and one of the lads, Derek. He sat against the, the window like, like we're playing, and he keep he said, "How come I keep losing here?" And what he couldn't realize, and these are little funny, like just an aside to what, what we're talking about. But he was sat there with his cards, like, and the reflection on the window, because everyone could see what cards he had in his hand, and they were he had a good hand, and his eyes looked like so, and everyone fold. You know, <laughs> this came for like just little things like that. And um, another time, I met George Best in a betting shop in in London, and it was me and. Um, bullshit Barry, he was with me, and we'd been we'd gone on a CND march, and we went and we were both United fans, mind. And anyway, I said I'm sure that was best going in that office in that betting office. So I thought I haven't met him, I'll go in. So open, I said, all right, George, and he went, hang on, you've just put a bet on. So he come back and he signed a sports graph on a piece of paper, and Barry goes, Mister George, Mister George, I could never fell through a hole in the ground, and he said some ridiculous things to him like. Um, I saw you on TV. He had a full beard best then. He said, I saw you on TV and you were clean shaven. And he, oh God, how you can grow a beard so quick. And I looked at him like that, looked at Barry. And Bess goes, you know, I heard a recorded TV. Don't you have recorded TV where you live? And I said, Barry, come on. See you, George. <laughs> but, Barry, come on, let's go. Little things, daft things that, you know, uh, things that you, you wouldn't, you don't see them now. Little, um, shops in Leicester Square where they have a, 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 a set of booths around and they have these lot slots and you put 50p in um, and there's a girl inside dancing with a snake or something ridiculous like that. Well, Derek, <laughs> Peter was on one end, he said, and Derek was on the other and he, he kept putting 50p's in. He thinks this show's going to end with her technique. It's just, it's not, I couldn't get it into his head. She's not going to take it. It's going to the same thing again. Yeah, exactly. You'll just keep putting 50p's in and everyone's doing the same. And she's just come up with this. They'll get a more racy version because you put more money in. Exactly. That's the point. That's what I'm trying to explain to you. <laughs> so me and George, the Scots, they were outside the shop and he come out and we said, and he bought five, five pounds worth of, of change, five pounds. We said, how many 50p's you got left? And he didn't have any. And he put them all in this machine. Oh, God bless. But anyway, he was a, he was a funny guy. And he was a militant guy, older than me. He's dead now. Um, there's not many of them left, but uh, but yeah, but as the older you get, the more people you know that die. I know it's a sad fact of life, isn't it, Terry? It, it is, is, it is, mate. Um, but there was a lot of laughs, to be honest. I mean, I'd have to, I'd have to sit back and really think of it. The, and there was a lot of, and there were serious times, you know, when people get the sack, and you try and try and try, and you know that you know the the only alternative is you're going to have to go to a a tribunal, and then you you know in your heart they haven't got a case. Yeah, it's just they've done something wrong. That's just yeah, that's horrible. That well, one of the things I I found in my time as a union rep, I don't know if you've had the same experience. It, it is is trying to explain to someone that a dismissal that feels unfair doesn't necessarily mean it's legally unfair. Mm. And um, you know, the burden of proof for an employer when they sack someone is that they, they their actions were reasonable at the moment they made the decision to dismiss you. That's the legal definition of yeah. fair dismissal. And you can't, it's so difficult to explain to someone who doesn't have any sort of legal training or even trade union experience that just because it doesn't feel like it was fair doesn't mean that it really is unfair in an employment tribunal. And, and of course, when you, I mean, you must have had this yourself in your workplaces. Everyone's a bloody expert when it comes to things like this. And, um, you know, someone will go around saying, oh, you know, I got dismissed for turning up late. I was only five minutes late. And everyone who knows, oh, you'll win an employment tribunal. You go to industrial tribunal, you'll definitely win. 
and you have to sit down with them and say, look, mate, you 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 might not, you might not, you know, mm. the chances of you winning an ET are, 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 are I mean, it's very difficult to say, given the, the, the you know, the, the, the sort of cases that come up at employment trouble to say what your average chances of winning are going to be. Mm. But there are some cases where you just look at, look at the case itself and you go, well, that's it. You, you're not going to win. You aren't mm. going to win because it's, it's down to that very simple test. Was it fair at the moment of dismissal? That's it. Yeah. That's how it works, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, so we've been going on for a little while now, so we'll, we'll wrap, this interview up very soon but what i wanted to ask before we do obviously you were a trade unionist at a time where you could argue trade unions in this country were at their strongest the 1970s mm. what what did you see in the trade union movement after the 1970s that maybe possibly made you think they're not as strong as they used to be and i don't think they're going to come back from this um Probably, and we've all talked about it, the, the, the aftermath of the miners' strike, um, because that was the chance, that was the one chance that the TUC had to call all the unions out on strike to support the miners. F forget this bullshit about ballots and stuff. It was a moral duty for them to support the miners, as the miners had supported everybody else in the past. Um, and you wouldn't have had these agent provocateurs in less in um, in Nottinghamshire being being doing what they did. If it had nipped, that was nipped in the bud in the beginning. But the 70s, for me, the unions were, were in power and into the 80s, even though the Thatcher had put those trade union laws were coming in piecemeal because they'd said, don't put them in all at once because they, they'll never have it. But we'll sit back and it's only a little bit. But you know there's a little bit more coming, a little yeah. bit more coming. Yeah. Because you, you've read what was in a in place of strife. And they just used what was in in place of strife in the Thatcher's bloody what's it? So when people moan, I said, "Well, you, you, the party that you vote for, or we voted for at the time, they did this, basically." Yeah. Anyway, um, that I saw the decline, not in my party because we were still hundred percent union, but in managers that came in, who came from graduates, who came in from they'd been to university to study law and economics. But they, they want they want six months practical experience of working in a factory. They're not actually working; they're just walking around with another manager shadowing. And they come out with some ridiculous statements um, to to people who um get get the goat that right up, you know, and stand to say, "Well, I think this job could be done better if you did it this way." Bang, that's it. That's got your goat up straight away. Things like that. The change came in. We were all right, as I say, right through the eighties, um, because. We were a strong union, as they were all were in the port. So it didn't, in that respect, um, affect us. But gradually, factories were closing. And so union involvement, um, now it's closed altogether, Castro, now anyway. when it, BP took it over, but eventually it's closed full, full stop now. But the weakening of car, the car industry, that's, I've noticed with that, um, They've, they've waited and waited for men to get older. Same in the post. And they've paid them. They've either retired normally or they've paid them a, a, off early, as in my case. Um, and you've gone on early retirement. All the old heads have gone. They're only left with young ones that don't really know. A few of them do, but they've been there a bit. But a lot of them don't. And they manipulate them. And this happens to me. I see it all through the country. And something was said the other night, on a, well, something I was listening to, um, about how you can man you manipulate people's minds. Ch young people today don't watch TV, BBC, Sky. They're on the. They're on. The, they get a different news source. So if you're on that news source, you can infiltrate their mind. But if you're not, they're not interested in what people say on politics. So they on, on because they're not listening to politics. They're looking at a podcast of whoever, um, or or or, or TikTok, TikTok of Rick Grimes. Yeah. 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 And uh, and and so that's where they, they do. That's where they find stuff out. So they go on the internet, whatever. But they're not really looking, and they haven't been for a good few years um, to represent their class. Class consciousness um, has disappeared. We knew 
that we were working class and we had to fight to get as much money or benefits, conditions, terms of employment as we could for, for, our, for us, for where we worked. We knew that the management were on that wage uh, level that was above there, but that's their job. We weren't aspiring to have their money. We were just wanted to make sure that we were okay. That to me is gone. It's gone to dog eat dog. And it's going back to what we said earlier on about the lump, where one man's working against another man. I'll do that, but I'll do it for a pound less. It's historical, isn't it, that? Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, even even if um even if workers didn't have a dare I say a Marxist understanding of the term, even even a working class person who knew it was them and us knew there was a difference between us as the working class and those as the ruling class. Even if you might not use terms like proletariat or bourgeoisie or petty bourgeoisie or whatever. If you knew there was a them and an us, you were class conscious. Yeah, that's even, right. Even that has, has largely died, hasn't it? In Well, that's, we discussed this. Britain, yeah, really. it has. We've discussed this, this them and us. Um, and, and it's true. I think I, I, I put it into an article, I think one of the trade union things, but yes. there definitely was, um, it's not knowing your place, it's knowing you're, you're a supreme being because you are a trade union member. And if you happen to be an official, a branch official, um, you are, you are something to, to you know to be. Like when you when they start getting out of the, the out of shape and then they they get to um to district officer level, mm, then they're controlled by them up there, not by them down there. And the, the branch second is as far as I I wanted to go. I didn't want to be a full time. I got offered to put in for a job. They can never promise you one, but I've known worse people get one. But you have to count out to the to the line of the of the trade union you've forgotten then that you once worked on the shop floor so you're then kowtowing now to what the government wants the unions to do right well we can't do this because of well hang on the members have voted for this well they can't have that um you know never mind that they that they're that they're the workers and they've voted on it we're not doing it and people have a disconnect then with branch level is the level where it, it has to happen because once you get past there, you're wasting your time trying to find some credible um, official to speak to you. Yeah, and most well, of them are sitting in the House of Lords now, anyway. Well, that's true. There's, there's not. Well, I can't, I can't think of a TUC general secretary that isn't a lord or a baron now. Um, well, the only one that refused one, didn't he? Refused it was Jack Jones, but he took a, an earldom, I think, after or something. He, he refused to go in the House of Lords, but he took an earldom. I can't remember yeah. exactly what it was. Very few trade union officials who've turned down an honour turned it down permanently. Yeah. Rodney Bickerstaff is about the only one I can think of uh, who, who refused an honour and never took one. Many mm. refused and then reconsidered at a later what date. Was he new, new P? Was he new P? Uh, no. He was new P, and then he new had the P, yeah. General Secretary of Unison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So, yes, most 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 people will take it at the first time of asking, or might turn oh. it down and take it at the second time of asking. Yeah, but but a lot of them have, have been grasping for this position since they became union of officials. They know what's at the end of the, the rainbow, well, the pot of gold. Absolutely, it's almost like it's a natural progression, isn't it? In that, if you become a trauma, I was going to mention this a, a little a little while ago. It's very easy when you get into the, when you say like the beyond branch secretary level, when you get into the full-time official level or you maybe get onto an executive level within a trade union, very easy to become institutionalised, isn't it? Mm. And let's, let's call it what it is. A lot of those positions either did or still do carry a certain level of expenses that go with it. So you might find yourself travelling around the country, staying in fairly reasonable hotels, I dare say, having your meals paid for, perhaps even you know, a few bob for a, a, a drink or two as well. And it's a very nice, comfortable lifestyle to get into, especially when you came from a shop floor. And yep. if you don't want to go back to that shop floor, your alternative is a future in the trade union movement as a, as a full-time official. The problem is, like you said, you end up with a complete disconnect mm. um, from where you came from. You're no longer in touch with the people that were on the ground. You're no longer part of that. You don't do it yourself anymore. And what you are instead is a trade union bureaucrat. And Absolutely. 
your your drive from there on in is always to be at or around that level. So it might be if you're a Labour affiliated union, have a crack at maybe becoming an MP somewhere. Yeah. You never know if you if you're in the right union and you speak to the right people, you might get parachuted into a very easy Labour seat to win, perhaps. Mm. Or like you said, you could ascend up, maybe become an assistant general secretary somewhere, or maybe even a, a general secretary, knowing that very, very few general secretaries ended up in poverty after they were. <laughs> Perish the thought. Perish the thought. Yeah. You know, they I always like to... end up landing on their feet, often yeah. on their feet in the House of Lords. Yeah, well, exactly. And that's where I think Dave Ward's heading. Yeah, yeah. And I think one of the big weaknesses of trade unions at that very high level is that there isn't, and I've said about this more than once, and I'll say it again, you need to create a cycle where people come from the bottom, go to the top, stay there for a term or two, and then come back down. And that's the important thing. They have to come back down again. They have to come back down to the job where they were before they ascended mm. in order that they can tell other people in their workplaces about their experiences, what they learn, how it works, and then that educates others so they can go up and come back down again the problem is you in modern trade unions they go up and that's it yeah you ascend and then you don't go anywhere else you certainly go go back yeah. to your workplace no no that's right and so all these people are, are, are being elected and ascending up through the annals of the of the trade union movement but they're not educating anyone that they leave behind on how to do it themselves no and, no. and that's that's a big weakness in the trade union movement and, the, and let's be fair or as fair as possible, those people that get up into the higher brackets of the trade union movement have got no interest in going back and telling people how to do it. No. No interest. They don't want to go back to that. They've, been, they've done it. They don't do it anymore. That's right. No way. No way. Is, are they going to go back and be a postman? No, exactly. You know, they're not going to go back to working in Castro or go back on a building site. They've got no interest in doing any of those things. They, they've been there and done it. And now... Their, their new career is in the trade union movement mm. and it can be quite lucrative it is well paid and um, there are especially if you're in the uh, the appropriate labor affiliated uh, trade yeah. union, there's a lot of other opportunities for you even if you don't necessarily want to be an mp you may be able to score a gig as a permanent member of staff in the labor party or something like that mm. yeah yeah that's that's the way isn't it it's just doors open for you Absolutely. The only the only one rep that I remember, he was a driver's rep. He was a member of the Communist Party. Worked for, I'm not sure, it wasn't Shell. He was a tanker driver um, in Ellesmere Port. And he became um, the district officer in Ellesmere Port. But you could see at meetings, he was, it was like he was getting told from the top, this is what's got to happen. And we were saying it from the bottom, and he wants to agree with us because he was one to rep, but it, that his bosses were telling him, no, you can't, they can't have that, or you can't have that, or whatever. And you could see, and I used to look at him sometimes and say, you're going to make yourself ill. Hmm. You either yeah. go back to tanker driving and represent your members from there, or become an, a councillor or something in the town, or forget us and carry on up. up. I can't forget where I came from. I said, well, you're going to make yourself ill. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen him for a few years. Still going, but um, he did. He did have a breakdown, but uh, I know I, I got told yeah. that. But he's yeah. okay now. But um, from what I hear, but yeah, it's and it takes a lot out of you. And I don't know many decent branch secretaries who aren't either divorced, or an alcoholic, or both. Yeah, that's absolutely not many. Yeah, yeah, goes with the territory. He does. Yeah. And the days when you had off-site meetings and you'd meet at night in a pub, back room somewhere. And this might be three nights a week. Yeah. And then obviously there's schools, education you go on and stuff like that to keep yes. you you're abreast right. of the laws and what have you. Yeah. And as you, say, uh, 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 as you say, there's a, there's a, I mean, I think I've had it myself a few times, that crisis of conscience that you sometimes have with what you believe in yourself pol politically and what your trade union's asking you to, to do mm. you know i i i had a crisis of, of conscience i suppose in 2022 when when my union at its annual conference voted through a motion 
supporting the war in Ukraine. Um, the, the, obviously, the NATO-backed war in Ukraine. Um, one of the most imperialist motions I think I've ever seen. Mm. And uh, yeah. it was then that I thought, this is, I, I can't stay in this union anymore. No. Um, my time here is done. Um, and I think it happens to, to a lot of people, politically educated people, um, especially from time to time. Because the trade union movement takes oftentimes very, very poor positions on a lot of political topics, doesn't it? Well, generally, they did over Brexit. Yes. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, you, you, you're talking about the despised book. You, I was reading there, you know, 64% of the of the constituencies in Britain voted Brexit. And yet people in those constituencies are working class, basically. Um it must have been represented by unions and they didn't seem to fall in line with that. It was all, we're the cranks. And I remember that comment and I read it again in that book uh, by David Lammy, where he said, um, oh, that will of the people bollocks. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Never mind the will of the people. Yeah. We're the, we'll decide what goes on yes. and we'll tell them. Yes. Put them back in the box then to the next yes. election. Then we'll call them out again when we want to be elected. And that to me, you know, it says it all. Well, I, I, I remember David Lammy, frankly, having a shit fit in 2016 when the, the referendum result came in. But he wasn't alone. Most of the most of the trade union bureaucracy had a shit yeah. fit as well. I mean, there were only two unions who came out openly and said they were against Brexit. And that was the RMT and ASLEF. Yeah. All the others... All the others, as far as I'm aware, and I'm prepared to be corrected on this, all of the others were all in on the European Union because they were still, um, well, they still had the words of Jacques Delors ringing in their ears from 1988 when he spoke at CUC. So don't worry yeah. about the Thatcher government and the Tories. The European Union can look after you. Yeah, the free movement of Labour looked after us, didn't it? Yeah. That's Yeah, and that was Jacques Delors. I remember that. And how they allowed him to come in and speak got, got me. You know, Jesus Christ. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, let, let, let's be absolutely honest. That was three years after the defeat of the miners, yeah. two years after the de defeat of the print workers at Wapping. Yeah. You know, it, the, this was a trade union movement that at the time was on its knees. Yes. And uh, a bureaucrat comes in and says, look, we can offer you an alternative to you fighting your own uh, ruling class and losing all the time. You can come in with us and the European Union will look after you. Hmm. Yeah, and, worked um, out well. You know, they, the entire trade union movement, with only a couple of exceptions, went all in on an imperialist anti-worker entity that is the European Union. And yeah, there are still did. people today, still people today in the trade union movement that will swear up and down that Brexit was the worst thing that ever happened to this country. Still. Well, I was I was fortunate or unfortunate to be of the age in 1975 when we had the referendum and I voted not to go in in the beginning. And I was glad that I got a chance to vote to come out in the end. So mm -hmm. it's gone full cycle for me. And I've been consistent in my views. I've never liked it. I've, even when they went through the Euro communism phase, never liked it. I've read some books on it. This is bollocks. Then it was the United States of Europe as against America. Bollocks. They never, the Britain was never going to be a part of that. You could see right through it all. Yeah. Yeah. But as a, as, and when people ask you things as a stop steward and stuff, it's not just about unions. They sometimes come and ask you advice about life and about ailments and death, obscure things. You know, I'm, I through my trade union um, time, I've learned more because I represented a lot of women at Castro. Um, there was over two hundred women there when I when I joined there, and I and women, some of them didn't want to speak to the female shop steward, so they'd call me and they'd tell me the most personal things that you can imagine, but they didn't want another woman to know. Mad. And I said, well, look, I, it's not going to go any further, blah, blah, blah. But I've learned more about female complaints about anything than than, than ever, than a man. Yeah. It's just mad that you think about these things. So much so that when I was in, when we moved to, I put in, I was, I was thinking about going into social work before I joined the post. And there was, there was a course going in Preston University and it was a six month followed by a two year course. I thought, I'll do it, I'll get expense. And then that, it'll at least be something that's doing some good. I was working part time for the Royal Mail then. 
So I went and had the interview, and I got interviewed by three women, and they asked me asked, <clears throat> they asked me about um, certain complaints and different things, and I said, look, I know all about toxic shock syndrome, I know all about uh, the menopause, I know everything about that kind of thing. Well, how do you know all this? So I told them each trade union experience, and they went, oh, well, to be honest with you, um, we'll let you know, but I think you'd be, you're going to be okay to go on the course. He actually sent me a letter saying you don't you don't have to do the six months, you can go straight on the course. That week, and I thought, right, and it starts in September. That week, the manager offered me full-time employment. And then you go, oh, I'm gonna be a student for two years, poverty stricken, and this guy's offering me full-time employment. What do I do? You go for the money, or I did. Of course, and, and yeah, absolutely, and 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 therein therein lies one of the problems that working class people face, doesn't it? To to go into a, a profession that requires a certain amount of study and and effort on your own part, which leaves you destitute. Yeah, means that you can't go for a more fulfilling job. You go for one that will pay, uh, pay more them. sooner, wouldn't you? Yeah, that's yeah. it. That's been that's absolutely. been my mistake. Yeah, and 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 I think it's you know you look back. And it's a regret, but um, nah, you know, all in all, I haven't got a lot of regrets regarding. The, I enjoyed my time at the post after that when I came back to, to Chester, and um, and I can say that I've, there's been some crap times being an official when you when you've got uh, redundancies or you've got um, you know the sickness interviews where you know somebody's going to go up the road and all that caper. Yeah, yeah. you just. I remember my manager to me one day said to me after about the fifth case, they were doing them all, having a purge, as they used to say. And he said, are you going to are you going to represent and put an argument up for all these people? And I said, every person that comes through that door that you want to discipline, I am going to put up an argument why you shouldn't, because that's my job. Well, even though you know that the I said, I don't know anything that they're what lazy or work shy. I don't know this. All I know is you're going to discipline them for being off sick. And I don't agree with it. And in fact, if you, and you'll be the same, if you brought Adolf Hitler in and I was representing him, I'd find a way to save him from the fucking hangman or try, I'd, I would find some way, an argument to make an argument because that's what a shop steward does. Any? Yeah, absolutely. You've got, to, you've, you've, absolutely. You've, got to, you've got to look for arguments. And he said, well, we're going to be here for a month. I said, well, don't call anyone else in then. Yeah, it's easy. If you don't Absolutely, want to go through... a whole point of a of a shop steward or a union rep yeah. is to is to defend the member. Yeah, defend the member regardless of what they think about the person on a personal exactly. level, and regardless of what, whether they think they did it or not. Those exactly. two things are completely irrelevant. That's you almost that's become like a, a sort of amateur lawyer, don't you? Sort of yeah, a, you do. You know, a barrister, if you will. It made Barristers will just defend people regardless. Yes. It not make judgments smile. about their guilt yeah. and not make judgments about them as people. You just, well, a, a, that's what you're there to do. Yeah. A friend of my brother's, Derek, he, um, he's a bit off-headed and he, he got into a bit of a place he worked anyway. They sacked him. And uh, and he, he appealed. And it was the days when you could appeal and, and you could get someone to say. So he asked me, would I? So I said, yeah. So I looked for case law and I couldn't really find anyone, any anywhere. That anyone had won a tribunal after admitting they smacked someone right in the face in the car park. And I said, Derek, I could, I'll try and find something to back your claim. But anyway, we went to, and the, it, the tribunal was in Stoke, Shrewsbury, sorry, Shrewsbury, very apt for a building worker. Yes. Anyway, um, we, so we went to the tribunal thing there and he lost, or, you know, they found against him. And he said to me, Well, thanks, you've done your best. Now, the guy that was representing the company came up to me after. And he said, you're wasting your time representing these deadheads, you know. And I went, beg your pardon. He said, um, I used to be a steward like you. He said, and uh, I saw the light and got out. Now I work for this firm that defends, that fights cases against people who are going to employment tribunals. And I went, well, I bet you feel proud of yourself. You've turned your back on, on your comrades to be cut to feather your own nest. Well, it's not like that, he said. I said, it sounds very much like that. I'll see you in another life, mate. And off I pop. I said yeah. to Derek, oh, did you hear him? right up himself and he was and that's people will do that but i couldn't do it and that's why i knew my station in life was to be a brand secretary till they took it away from me because i yeah. wasn't gonna not represent people because someone no, said 
it's not the way to do it. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, well, I, I know from experience the number of the number of people I know in the in the trade union movement who ended up working in human resources departments of employers. There you uh, go. Because because the skills that you learn as a trade union rep are very useful to employers in in human yep. resources. Yep. You know, um, yeah, it's amazing how many people who may if you put them on the spot would have said, No, 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 I'll never I'll never switch sides. When the offer comes, they do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I've seen well, we'll a few end, of those. Absolutely. So we'll 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 end the interview there. Okay. Um, as always, it's it's I I always enjoy talking with you about trade unions and trade unionism. I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned, especially from the 1970s, uh, because obviously we had the the National Builders Strike, we had two miners strikes in the early 70s as yeah. well. And it was a it was a it was a rare decade for working class people because they could actually take on management and win. Yeah, management were uh, frightened. Absolutely, uh, and they had reason to be frightened because the working class were way stronger then than they are now. Well, and I think the nineteen seventies is a, a a useful decade for anyone who wants to learn about trade union trade unionism and working class strength. Uh, yeah, to look at the nineteen seventies. Oh, definitely, definitely. Management were frightened of the shop steward. Because they knew that the shop of the shop steward's power. Because yeah. I mean, they knew if they upset him and he goes to his members and and blah blah. And there was none of this balloting. You just show of hands and it was outside the gates. If you know, very rarely have I called a meeting. No, in fact, never. I called a meeting for a, a for strike acts and that they haven't walked out the gate that day. But one day even or or a token strike of half a day, blow up mm -hmm. dinner time, whatever, just to show management that you're still there. Don't. Be trying to take the piss. Yeah. It's absolutely. gone now. It's gone now. But we've we've got to try and rebuild that somehow. Mm. It, it, it might take a while and it might take a lot of work, but we have to go back to how things were because if we don't, God alone knows what's in store for the working class. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, on that bombshell, I shall say <laughs> thanks for joining me, Terry. And uh we'll speak again on this soon, I'm yeah. very sure. Thanks, Jason. See you soon. Thanks. Bye.